Thank you so much, everyone, for joining um, our webinar tonight, Managing Wildfire Risks to Your Western Washington Home. I'm really excited that you all could join. My name is Rosie McGoldrick. I'm with the Washington Service Corps, and I'm serving with King Conservation District. The webinar tonight is being hosted by the King Conservation District. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, we're a unique type of government agency. We're a special purpose district, uh, similar to water or sewer district. And we work with private landowners to help them steward the natural resources on their property. So our agency covers a wide variety of natural resource management assistance. And for this webinar tonight, we'll be focusing on how you can manage your home and community to be more wildfire resilient. And we want to extend a special thank you to our local and state partners for joining us tonight and um, for helping to make webinars and events like these possible. And our presenters tonight want to do a quick introduction. So we have a lot of great experts joining us. Uh, we have um, Ashley Bazina, who is a Community Wildfire Preparedness Coordinator with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Um, we have Matt Axe, who is a Wildfire and Forest Resilience Coordinator with King Conservation District. Uh, we have special guest speaker, Congresswoman Dr. Kim Schreier, who is representative of the 8th District of Washington. We have Laura Whiteley Binder, who is the Climate Preparedness Program Manager with King County Climate Action Team. And we have Addison Houston, who is a mitigation response planner with Environmental Health Services with the Public Health uh, Seattle and King County. So as we mentioned, we'll have we'll cover a lot of content tonight, but just to give you an idea of some things, um, the presentations we'll cover, uh, we'll be discussing the Western Washington wildfire pattern, fire behavior, wildland urban interface and climate change, creating a dispensable space around your home, uh, writing an evacuation plan, King County wildfire strategy, and how to protect yourself from wildfire smoke. And we want to start with this image. Um, you'll see that a wildfire has burned this region and that the home in the middle has been spared. And this is no coincidence because the landowner has taken several actions to help to protect their home and create a dispensable space. And this is why I imagine all of you are joining tonight to learn more about what you can do to protect and prepare your family, home and community for wildfire season. With the season beginning earlier and climate change making the weather warmer, it's great that you all are here joining tonight to learn more about wildfires in Western Washington and ways to prepare for the impacts of wildfire season. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ashley Blazina, who is the Community Wildfire Preparedness Coordinator for the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Thank you, Rosie. Um, as, as Rosie mentioned, my name is Ashley Blazina. I'm the Community Wildfire Preparedness Coordinator in the Forest Health and Resiliency Division. It's, I work for the Washington Department of Natural Resources, uh, work throughout the state, uh, but today I'm really going to be focusing on what, what the wildland urban interface looks like in the Puget Sound and how um, some of those changes to, to our vegetation, to the fuels that are in the Puget Sound um, may affect climate change and are, are working um, vice versa. So first off, I'll just give a brief introduction of what the WUI is. Um, most people have probably heard about the wildland urban interface, but it's really where structures and wildland or non-developed areas are meeting. And so that's, that's really where we see the WUI in Washington state. And I'll say um, one thing just, just to, to start out is I'm going to be showing you guys a lot of maps of the Washington, um, Washington's wildland urban interface. This map is still technically in draft phase. Uh, we still need to get the final okay from the commissioner, but these are largely um, finalized. And so it will give you guys a good idea of where that wildland urban interface really is in King County. And so for the state, um, what our definition really is, and it's a broad one because we had to think about what was really gonna make sense for the entire state in terms of how we define the wildland or urban interfaces, where structures and other human development meet or intermingle with undeveloped wildland or vegetative fuels. So 
pretty broad. Um, and a lot of people tend to think, oh, I, I probably don't live in the wooey. Um, I, I don't think that that really makes sense for me. Um, I live in a more urban area or I live in a more suburban area. Um, but I just wanted to quickly toggle to this map, which is King County's wooey. All of the areas in red and orange are considered wildland urban interface. So for those of you who live in Seattle proper, there are still pockets of wooey. Um, a lot of that is that gray urban cover, but we have a lot of areas on the outskirts and throughout the county that are still that wildland urban interface. Um, this is our methodology. I just briefly wanted to show this flow chart that my colleague created. Happy to share this with anyone that would like a copy, but we're not gonna get too deep into the methodology. If anyone wants additional, um, additional feedback or uh, details on this, I'm happy to provide them. But just to go a little bit into this, and it will be a quick overview, because as Rosie said, it's a pack schedule. The way that we set up this map was pretty simple in terms of how we really laid it out. All the gray areas on, on the WUI map are the urban areas. So those are where their predominant cover is structures. It doesn't have that, it doesn't meet that wildland uh, cover um, percentage. And the interface are those areas where are kind of neighboring, they hug the urban areas. And so they usually have wildlands on at least one side of, of, of their development of those structures. And the intermix is, I think typically people think of intermix as kind of being those areas where it's a one cabin, one room cabin in the woods, but increasingly for Western Washington, we see intermix as those areas that have a lot of new development. And as you guys can see, these are the areas that a lot of times we're now considering the suburbs or um, newer developments, but it's still, even with the amount of density that some of you guys may, may be um, seeing in your communities, a lot of these areas are still meeting that wildland urban interface definition and still have some of those um, associated risks or just things to consider. I'll say um, when thinking about wildfire and and how that could affect um, our communities. King County still has a lot of wildlands as well, though. Um, a lot of areas that aren't developed that don't have any or very few homes or structures on them. Um, but we choose to call this potential buoy because a lot of King County is areas that could eventually have some intermix or even become interface. Um, and so something to keep in mind as, as we're going through this is that this is a living, breathing map, not necessarily a static one that we've kind of set in stone. The wildland urban interface is continuing to grow. It's the fastest growing land type in our state. But we also have some areas that are not potential wooey, and those are things like our national parks and wilderness areas. So those are the areas that we've actually taken out. However, that's a pretty small chunk of the pie in terms of our entire state area. So why does this matter? Why do we care about why about the wildland urban interface? Um, one of the things that we have to think about is how fire has shaped our region and how this new development, these different types of fuels, these homes are changing that. So this map on the left is the historic wildfire regime as it's, as it's kind of been pieced together with historic data. The areas that you see in black are those areas where you have the typical 150 to 200 year fire intervals. So the ones that we're, we mainly associate with Western Washington, but as you can see the lavender and um, the beige areas, those are areas where we, have a lot more mix severity fires, had a lot more frequent fires. And there's a lot of parts of Western Washington that have this. Um, one of, a lot of that overlap is actually in areas that are now wildland urban interface, interestingly. So um, you might notice some areas in white, those are some of the areas that are a little more urban, urban, higher urban density. And that's, um, they weren't able to collect as much data to really give a good historic uh, accurate 
accurate historic measure of what that fire regime might have been. That doesn't mean that it didn't fit one of these particular categories in the past. But the wildland urban interface is changing. It's changing how how fire might behave, um, what we could see, what's actually going to burn. Um, one of the things that we see quite often in a fire is that the homes are the most flammable component in that environment. Um, we'll see homes burn down that are surrounded or have a lot of standing green vegetation. Again, another house that burned down, still trees in the background, standing green. And here's one from Colorado. Uh, I just am always kind of floored by this image. We see some damage to the trees right next to the house, probably from that radiant heat from the actual house. But just something to keep in mind, our houses don't have roots. They can't take up that additional moisture. The vegetation around our houses often can. And so our wildfire regime is changing dramatically. Um, in addition to the amount of fire suppression and um, the, the amount of additional vegetation that has grown back in our area from what was here since time immemorial, um, the additional houses are making it a completely different dynamic. And so how fire is going to react is, is, is still a bit of a mystery, but we're, we have a lot of folks who are working to piece this together. Um, in terms of what some of these areas look like and some of those mixed severity, so the purple and beige areas we see a lot of things, a lot of skate, a lot of landscapes, ecosystems that you guys are probably pretty used to. So things like Gary Oak Woodlands or um, some areas that are a little more open, uh, might see some balds, might see some different types of um, mixed forests. And for that, those areas that are in black, where we have the much longer uh, fire cycles, um, I put up those pictures. Uh, that Van Pelt drew back in 2007 of just what that would really look like on that cycle of a dug for hemlock forest that a lot of us associate with our area in terms of how it really looks um, or how it used to look when it did have that fire coming through every 200 to 600 years. Something to keep in mind is how frequently we've had these fires in the past um, and when they are coming in how, how large of a fire we can really expect. Um, these are some calculations that were done by different colleagues. This is a slide that uh, Dan Donato shared, my colleague Dan Donato shared on a presentation we did last year, but just breaking down how big of a fire we could potentially see in our region given the time between fires. Uh, right now we're more in that 100 to 200 year block uh, to give you guys some examples of this really playing out uh, in recent years, the in 1700 throughout the region, there are fire scars and marks of a fire that was about 100 uh, or 1 million acres. Um, and so that's right in line with what we could kind of expect for that for that range. Um, then 200 years later, we see a 1 million acre fire in 1902. Tillamook burn, 350,000 3, acres. So these estimates are not something, they're just kind of being thrown up willy-nilly. Uh, these are hard numbers and something that we really have to be thinking about in terms of how we prepare. In terms of Western Washington and large fire, um, there's a few major components to really think about and that have been seen in the past. Um, the four, four things are ignition source, short-term dry weather, seasonal drought, and east wind events. So when we're thinking about how we're going to prepare, we also have to think about what are some of those different um, sources that, that are going to uh, come into play. In terms of climate change, um, a lot of these are being exacerbated. And so how fire might occur, it might behave, especially in the wildland urban interface is something we have to really think about. Uh, ignition sources, uh, up to 90% in recent years, or sometimes surpassing that, of fires in Western Washington and Western Oregon are caused by people. And so 
as we see more and more people come into our region between uh, April of 2019 and 2020, our region saw 166 new people per day. There's going to be more and more people who are doing things that could be potential sources of ignition. We also see that people are moving increasingly into that wooey, that those orange areas on the map for the intermix, that, that area is increasingly growing and it's uh, our intermix is much bigger than our interface in terms of how we're really um, laying that out. So we're gonna potentially see a lot more of these ignition sources, especially next to some of our wild lambs. In terms of that short-term dry weather, we're also seeing, um, this is from the Climate Impacts Group um, at the UW from a 2015 report that they did. All, all different estimates show a pretty, um, pretty alarming, in, in my mind, uh, temperature change increase um, over the next uh, now 80 years. And so that short-term dry weather in terms of how many days we really have drier weather are gonna increase as well. In terms of drought, uh, we definitely have years that are wet, wetter than average, but on the whole, um, we see that most years have um, some form of drought, whether that be mild or extreme. Um, the increasing colors on the bottom are, are showing how moderate or severe that is. And as you can see in recent years, it's definitely gotten more and more clustered together. So seasonal drought, something that is definitely gonna increase as well. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we have these uh, predictive, the Northwest Predictive Services puts out these different monthly uh, fire potential outlooks. And so like for this year in July, which is when we really start to see wildfire season typically heating up. But this year we definitely had a lot of early season fires as most of you all are aware. Um, this is not necessarily looking at some of those more microclimate um, droughts or, or short-term dry weather or uh, wind events that could potentially dry out a lot of our, our vegetation and our fuels or our, um, anything around our home. And so something to keep in mind is that this is definitely done at a, a larger scale. It's for across the country. And so take these types of um, outlooks, these predictions with a grain of salt. The one thing I really wanted to point out though, um, because I think it might not be particularly clear with this presentation is that the wildland urban interface is not necessarily synonymous with wildfire risk. There are a lot of factors that go into wildfire risk um, in terms of where you're living and what, and what activities might be, be occurring, um, what the historic fire regime is, topography, slope, aspect, a lot of different features. And so it's really important to, to make sure that if you live in the WUI, you're not saying, oh, I'm at the highest risk. Um, there's a lot of different factors and a lot of things that you can do to help mitigate these risks. And I think Matt's actually going to go into that. So with that, I'll leave my um, contact details right here. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, feel free to email me or give my work cell a call. I'm happy to chat more. And with that, I'll give it over to Matthew Axe. And thank you very much, Ashley. As Ashley said, my name is Matthew X. I'm with King Conservation District. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us for our webinar tonight around wildfire and wildfire smoke. What I'm really gonna to touch on is really talk about fire behavior, a defensible space, and last but not least, evacuation plan. I assist communities and individual landowners by identifying issues and concerns that could increase or decrease the chances of their home being damaged in a wildfire event. I also conduct webinars and presentations throughout King County to further education around wildfire as I'm doing tonight. But enough about what I do. I'm gonna show a quick video with sound about how communities can prepare their homes to be more fire adaptive. After the video, I will continue on with my presentation. This is Fred. Hi, Fred. 
Fred lives in a community that is on the edge of natural areas and where wildfire has been a part of the landscape and human history for centuries. Fred's neighborhood is much like your neighborhood and the neighborhoods of 120 million people who live in and near forests and grasslands throughout America. Because Fred lives near land that needs fire to be healthy, he knows he has to live with wildfire. Fire is simply inevitable where Fred lives, so he has been working hard to prepare. He has been clearing vegetation from around his home and making sure his house is built with materials that are less likely to burn. Last year, he replaced his wood shake roof with a metal one. Fred also knows that his effort will be most effective when the whole neighborhood is prepared, so he's also been talking with his neighbors and encouraging them to prepare for wildfire. Hi, Fred's neighbors. Fred has even been packing a go kit with important papers, pills, photographs, and supplies in case he has to evacuate during a wildfire. Fred's neighbor, Damien, is a volunteer with the local fire department. Damien and his co-workers train together for forest fires, are properly equipped, and talk to the community about wildfire risk, the importance of being ready to evacuate if necessary, and even the best evacuation routes to use. Damien and his co-workers are also trained to use controlled burns in natural areas to improve community safety and give nature a boost. Across town, Lupe is working in her small bakery. She too understands that there is a risk of wildfire in her community, and so she has taken action to prepare her business. She has her computer inventory backed up off-site and has a business continuity plan that will help her stay in business after wildfire. Lupe's Aunt Mary works at City Hall. Mary has been working with the community to update the Community Wildfire Protection Plan and draft codes and ordinances that help people build new homes in the most appropriate places with materials that are less likely to catch fire. Mary works with developers to make sure new neighborhoods have more than one way in and out in case there is an evacuation. She has even been working with her local land management agencies as they identify land around the community that needs a little more work to be ready for wildfire. Fred, Damien, Lupe, and Mary are all working to make their community better able to live with wildfire because they know fire is natural where they have chosen to live. They understand their risk and are actively working to reduce that risk. Fred, Damien, Lupe, and Mary live in a fire-adapted community, even if they don't realize it. As we have seen from Fred and his neighbors, there are many tools and strategies for communities adapting to wildland fire. Not every community will use every tool, but generally speaking, the more actions a community takes, the more ready for fire it will become. As we have seen, Fred and his neighbors are taking action before a wildfire. But it is important to realize that community preparedness before a fire, safe and efficient wildfire response during a fire, and a well-resourced and supported recovery after a fire are all part of the process. What does success look like? Just like in Fred's neighborhood, success looks like many people working together to prepare for the effects of wildfire. In that way, the responsibilities and benefits of adapting to wildfire are shared among all those who live in places where fires burn. Here are five easy ways you can help your community become more fire adapted. 1. Make sure your home is prepared for wildfire by using fire-resistant construction materials and keeping vegetation from touching the structure. 2. Talk to your neighbors about wildfire and encourage them to take action too. 3. Prepare your family for an evacuation by making an emergency kit and having an evacuation plan. 4. Find out if your community has a community wildfire protection plan. Volunteer to work with your local fire response organizations to create or update it. 5. Visit www.fireadaptedwashington.org to learn more. 
Thank you for that. And in 2020, Washington State had approximately 1,700 fires that burned approximately over 800,000 acres. With here on the western side, the summer fire burning approximately 500 acres and damaging and destroying multiple homes and being one of the largest wildland urban interface fires that we have seen in Washington, Western Washington in some time. And most recently, we had the Green Valley fire just between Black Diamond and Auburn that started from a brush fire and grew to burn about 50 acres and jeopardize homes. There are multiple reasons why wildfire has become a rising concern in Western Washington. Ashley spoke about some, and I'm gonna mention a few others. Past forest management practices that have left a lot of fuels on our forest floor, paired with an increase in air temperature, a decrease in summer rainfall, and earlier snowmelt has led to drier fuels in our forest. Lastly, as Ashley had mentioned, we have seen an increase in our wildland population and our wildland urban interface. These type of development pose additional risk when it relates to wildfire. First, there will be more wildfires due to human ignition because of the increase in activity. A few examples that you've seen in the first two presentations are campfires. We're seeing off-road vehicle recreation, fireworks. Secondly, wildfires that occur will pose a higher risk to our lives and homes. They are harder to fight and we will not be able to let natural fires burn. Let's discuss and how we determine how a wildfire can start and spread. First, we look at the fire triangle. Fire needs three elements to occur, oxygen, heat, and fuel. Secondly is the fire behavior triangle, which also depends on three different elements. Once again, we need, it needs fuel. This is anything that can burn wood, plants, structures, weather, it can affect the rate and degree to which fuels dry out and the rate fire spreads. Climate change is affecting how the fast these fuels are drying out in our forest. And last but not least is topography. Wildfire typically spreads uphill and slopes can affect how quickly a fire can move. Out of both of, the, both of these triangles, the only element we can control is fuel to improve our wildfire resiliency. We cannot eliminate fire, but we can reduce our vulnerability by managing three different types of fuels. First, are those fine fuels. This is the dead or, dead or dried leaf litters, needles, small branches that are on our homes, on or around our homes. Landscape bark is also a fine fuel that dries out quickly during our summer and can become ignitable. Secondly is our man-made fuels. These are, these are our lawn chairs, construction material, additional, additional structures. And lastly is ladder fuels. These are, these are plants, woody debris, structures that could allow a fire to spread from the surface of the ground to the canopy of the trees. Having ignitable fuels around our homes can increase the chances of our home being affected by a wildfire ignition source. Having an accumulation of fine fuels can ignite by a windblown ember from a wildfire up to a mile away. Embers can create a surface fire that could create a large catastrophic crown fire if fuels allow a fire to climb into the canopy of our forest. So we can decrease the chances of being affected by one of these ignition sources by creating a defensible space. A defensible space is a natural or landscaped area around our homes that is maintained and designated to reduce fire danger. A defensible space is broken down into three different home ignition zones. They start at your home and go out to 100 feet or further depending on different conditions. Zone one is the immediate zone. It starts at your home and extends out to five feet around homes or structures. We're looking at the roof, decks, and other attachments around the exterior of our homes for fine fuels. Remember, these are those dead leaves 
needles and twigs that accumulate. Secondly is zone two. That's that next five to 30 feet around your home. We wanna maintain this area lean, clean and green to reduce the effects of a wildfire. And lastly is zone three. This is the extended zone. And it's that next 30 to 100 feet away from your home or additional structures. We are identifying and removing ladder fuels by increasing spacing between our shrubs and our trees, along with increasing visibility and access for emergency services, all the while managing for a healthy Western Washington forest. But that zone one and zone two is considered the home protection zone and are the most important zones to work in because it's where we get the highest impact on our defensible space. As spoken about in the video at the beginning of the presentation, when neighbors work together to create interlocking home ignition zones, it, create, it increases the overall wildfire resiliency of everyone. So working together with your neighbors helps. So let's take a look what I commonly see when I conduct a wildfire safety evaluation. In zone one, I commonly see those fine fuels built up in the roof valleys, gutters and around the base of the home. I see stacked firewood and denser dead vegetation next to the home that could create ladder fuels that could increase the chances of a home being damaged in a wildfire event. And lastly, I see landscape art. We decrease our risk by removing these fine fuels from the roof, gutter, and around the base of our homes. When it starts to warm up, move that firewood out at least 30 feet from the home. Remove dead vegetation, increase plant spacing. And last but not least, replace landscape bark with hardscape materials like rock, concrete, pavers. This will decrease the chances of fire starting on or around your home during a wild, from a wild windblown ember. Zone two, large gas, gas tanks that are surrounded by vegetation, dormant or dead grass, and additional structures is what I typically see. Remove vegetation five feet around your gas tank and place hardscape materials around it to decrease the effects of a surface fire. Maintain green grass and mow to four inches or shorter. And additional structures should be managed the same way we manage our homes to potentially create interlocking zones. And zone three, we are looking at for accessing emergency services. Does your home have an address sign that is easily seen at all times of the day? Is vegetation crowding the driveway? And is your forest healthy and resilient to wildfires? This home had the recommended sign that was visible at any time of the day. We want to ensure our driveways have 12 feet, they're 12 foot wide with 15 foot of clearance and height. And we always want to maintain or improve our forest health and resiliency. Now we wonder, we've done all this great work and how do, what do we now gotta do? We have to do regular maintenance. This decreases the chance of our home being damaged or destroyed by wildfire ignition source. Last but not least, we should always be thinking about evacuation. An evacuation plan is just as essential as a defensible space. Pre-planned evacuation routes can identify every route available to evacuate during a natural disaster. One thing to add to your evacuation plan is a go bag. To name a few items that could be in your bag, important documents like home deeds, insurance, life insurance documents, water, medical kit, Having a pre-planned evacuation route and a go bag can decrease the time needed to evacuate during a wildfire event. In summary, we've talked about fire behavior, defensible space, and evacuation plans. 
I will put my contact information in the chat for anybody that would like further knowledge around how you can protect yourself from a wildfire. But right now, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Kim Schreier has represented the 8th Congressional District in the House, U.S. House of Representatives since 2018. Congresswoman Schreier sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Committee on Agriculture, and Subcommittee on Conservation and Forestry, placing her front and center on wildfire and forest, forestry issues. She joins us to talk tonight to talk briefly about the work Congress is doing on these issues. I would like to thank you for joining us, Congresswoman Schreier. Thank you, Matthew. I was listening to your presentation and I thought it was excellent. And, uh, you know, you cover a lot of what I cover when I talk with, with my constituents at town halls. And we're going to be doing a lot more of them this year because already uh, DNR has responded to over 200 wildfires uh, this year. And in my district spans Washington, Western Washington and Central Washington. And I'll tell you, just a couple years ago, I was really thinking of Central Washington as the major risk zone, Kittitas County, Chelan, Douglas. But it is becoming clearer and clearer that we have that, uh, that threat in Western Washington as well. And we certainly saw it last year when we had wildfires everywhere, Graham, Bonnie Lake, you know, this is west of the Cascades. And in addition, uh, we had smoke that was just awful. I think it was, you know, it, it was at least a week, I think two weeks of really apocalyptic seeming skies. And so I, we have many ways that we are going to have to, I'm gonna admit somebody into this room, even though I don't know who that is because now I'm the host. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we can't control, which is what Matt was talking about, but there's a lot that we can control. And so you've just heard about uh, building codes, putting anything but a wood shake roof on your house, uh, creating a defensible space and being prepared to go. I might add to that just a couple things that I've thought about with my own family um, that in addition to having a bag of the absolute must takes to just have a list. Because when we think about what to take with you in an emergency, it's this, it's, I believe the six P's. And Matthew, you could probably help me on this one, but it's people, so don't forget your relatives, right? Pets, prescriptions, photographs, uh, PCs, meaning uh, uh, you know, your, your computers, um, photographs, I think I got plastic, your, um, your credit cards and papers, uh, like you were alluding to your insurance papers, your deeds, your home, those kinds of things, because, um, those are things you're going to want to have. And in fact, somebody gave me some really good advice that I'll pass on. This is not what I'm working on in Congress, but if you take pictures of those things, um, and email them to yourself, then even if you leave everything at home, you will have those images with you. Um, because it's a scary time. And also with regard to evacuation, make a plan with your kids. Have a, a third person who, uh, who you can reach out to in case they can't get in touch with you and have a meeting spot where you've just agreed that in any emergency, this is where you'll be. Because sometimes it's those moments where we all think we're gonna be together when it happens, but we might not be. Uh, I wanted you to know that in Congress, I, I um, kind of take this on from the you know 30,000 foot level. And some of the things that I'm working on are being prepared. I'm about to introduce legislation for prescribed burns, exactly what Matt was talking about, that if we can take out some of the, the underbrush, the debris, the tiny trees, all of that fuel that has accumulated in our forests from decades of really not managing and not allowing natural fires to take place, if we can get that out, we reduce the risk of these catastrophic wildfires. And so I know that individual communities are working on this around their own perimeter to create a safer space. Anywhere where there's a wildland urban interface should be doing that. And, uh, and you know, my job is to make sure that we have the resources in the state uh, and in the country to address our state forests, our, na our national forests, and make sure that we have we have healthy forests and avoid these catastrophic wildfires. Um, I also wanted to let you know that I'm always working to get resources and equipment to our firefighters. They are 
such heroes that put their lives on the line, their health on the line, that smoke is toxic to breathe. And so I want to make sure that they have GPS and the, the, uh, the equipment they need, equipment from the Department of Defense, like surplus helicopters that they can use to manage uh, wildfires. Um, so I want to also thank them for their help. And then, um, I, you know, finally, I would just love to just talk about all of our personal responsibility. Matt showed a great slide of uh, a car driving over, a truck driving over some grass, a campfire, uh, and there are things that we can do. You know, lightning uh, ignites some fires, but a lot of fires are human caused. And so I would just ask you to be mindful. If you're going to have a campfire, make sure it is absolutely positively all out you know, he will tell you pour water on it, put dirt on it, and uh, and make sure that it doesn't then uh, become a wildfire. Uh, same thing with driving, and and your engine or your exhaust pipe can ignite grasses. That is how a lot of these fires have started, uh, and uh, and fireworks. As we think about Fourth of July, um, that is why we ask you to go and see fireworks somewhere else and not do that at your own house because it really is a perilous activity. So I just wanna thank you all for attending and, for, and for, for paying attention to how you protect yourselves. I guess the last thing I'll say, I was down in Graham and walked, uh, walked the fire line with, uh, with firefighters last year um, in September. And it was really striking to see which houses made it and which houses didn't. And the ones that made it had a lot of defensible space and it makes a huge difference. So take those words to heart and thank you very much for having me today, Matt. Right, thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, which is Laura Whitley Binder. She is from King County Emergency Management and you can take it away, Laura, thank you. And thank you again, Congresswoman. Hi, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm Laura Whiteley Bidner. I'm the Climate Preparedness Program Manager for King County. So I work with King County agencies and communities on preparing for the impacts of climate change. And my co presenter, who is not here, but certainly as part of the work that I'm presenting, is uh, Jared Schneider from the King County Office of Emergency Management. So I am, uh, what I wanted to present to you today is just a, a quick update about some work that we're doing at King County to develop a more integrated strategy for wildfire risk reduction. So, you know, as you've been hearing and perhaps even kind of recognizing from your own experiences, the recent headline grabbing wildfires in California, wildfire smoke events locally have really prompted a lot of conversation, discussion, questions around the potential for wildfire in Western Washington and what we need to be doing in our communities to both be able to reduce risk, prepare for, and respond to these events when they happen. So it's really been this, this series of headline grabbing stories coming out of, of California, coming out of Oregon, and then our own local experiences with wildfire smoke that have been, been key factors in taking this issue that we kind of always thought happened somewhere else and, and leading us to realize, oh, wait a minute, actually, maybe this isn't just everybody else's problem. And then, as you saw earlier, uh, the new DNR wildland urban interface maps, those are also prompting a lot of conversations around, again, you know, driving, I think, home the message that wildfire risk is a lot closer to home than we, than we have tended to think in the past. The other motivation for this strategy work is also the fact that climate change is occurring and climate change is changing the frequency, intensity, and duration of events that uh, can affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's changing those conditions that increase the potential for wildfires. So going back to that Swiss cheese analysis uh, that, or uh, example that Ashley was using earlier, it's, you can kind of think of us climate change making those holes bigger, which means it makes it a lot more likely that we're gonna get that confluence of events that line up and create the conditions favorable to fire. What's really important to remember in the context of climate change and really in the context of managing wildfire risk both for today and going forward is that it's today's choices that shape our vulnerabilities. So all the things that Matt's been talking about, the things you can do at, within your own, with your properties, 
and then what taking a step back from the individual property level to the community level, things that we can be doing as communities and as community partners, those are the decisions we're making today. Those decisions we make are what really is going to influence our vulnerability to wildfire going forward. So the King County Wildfire Risk Reduction Strategy is something that we're developing right now. I'm sorry that I don't have a finished product for you right now, but we are working on this. And this is, again, this is something that we uh, really wanted to uh, get going on uh, early. So this wildfire strategy, it's going to be a first ever strategy for King County. This is a strategy developed by King County communities for King County communities. It's an integrated approach to uh, managing wildfire risk that's going to look at forest health, the wild and urban interface and emergency response. This is an action in our new 2020 strategic climate action plan. I call it new because it was actually officially adopted by King County Council on May the 4th. Um, but we went ahead and we got going on it knowing that there was a there's an urgency to this work and, and strong interest in getting going on what we can do uh, at, at a range of scales to reduce wildfire risk. And as I noted, it, this is an interdisciplinary plan. This is a strategy that is both informed by and involving partners within King County and beyond King County. So this is a strategy that's bringing in input from forest and, and other landowners and, and, and land managers, uh, from WUI or wildland urban interface communities and from our emergency management community. It's really important that we bring all of those together uh, for this work. In terms of the outcomes from this strategy, we are looking at this as a high level strategy that's going to help us identify where we need to focus our future efforts. One of the things that we observed in the last few years with, again, this growing awareness and concern around wildfire is that lots of different organizations were, were doing more work around this issue around wildfire risk reduction, but it was very hard to know who's doing what and, and to think about like, to think about what may be falling through the cracks as we're all running around trying to do a better job at managing this risk. So one of the things that we really want to do and see come out of this strategy is a better understanding of what's the work that's needed and where should we be focusing those future that future work where we can have a bigger impact. We also want to recognize there's a lot of really good work that is happening like what Matt's doing with King, through King Conservation District to support property based or uh, wildfire risk management. So we want to make sure we're leveraging that and amplifying that. You know, that we're doing some good stuff. Let's make sure we keep doing it. Let's see what we if we can do more of it. And then we also want to look for those opportunities for increased coordination, reduced duplication of effort, and again, just really maximizing the resources and the the time that people are investing in trying to tackle this complex challenge. So I'll close by noting that. Uh, we are, a couple more slides, sorry. Um, we are doing some interviews or recently wrapped up some interviews to really help inform the strategy. We wanted to hear from folks like Matt, folks at DNR like Ashley, and our emergency, our, our emergency responders and others about what they were seeing out there in terms of needs and opportunities for, for managing wildfire risk. And just wanna note some of the things that we were hearing, so these may resonate with you. Uh, certainly needing more public awareness about wildfire risk. Um, we need more public information that's tailored to Western Washington. Western Washington forests are not the same as Eastern Washington. And so when we have literature around wildfire risk reduction that is all tailored to Eastern Washington, all the imagery is Eastern Washington, it just makes it a little bit harder to, to see ourselves and to see our, our homes and the places that we care about here in Western Washington in that work. The other thing that's really important to note is that some of the approaches prescribed for managing wildfire risk in Eastern Washington and the drier interior west may not be entirely appropriate for our Western Washington forests. We have different systems over here. So we really need to be looking at what are the right messages, the right and the right set of tools for Western Washington forests. We certainly need, we heard a lot of requests for more support for FireWise and other landowner assistance. We heard a lot around the need for changes in building and zoning codes to really help reduce that risk. Uh, certainly heard a lot around evacuation planning, lots of concerns about adequate ingress and egress and, and good planning around evacuation. Uh, we heard the need for additional wildfire response training, more information on managing wildfire smoke. Our next speaker, Addison, is going to 
talk to us all about wildfire smoke, and more shared resources to really help improve coordination and to understand both the risks and opportunities that are out there. So I'm going to close with also uh, an outgrowth, uh, a new new work we're going to be doing in addition to the new work we're doing on the wildfire strategy. Um, in the course of our conversations with uh, folks around the King County region around the wildfire smoke strategy. Again, we're in these early stages of, of starting to work on this strategy. But one of the things that was very clear was the, that there's a need for a wildfire smoke strategy. So, you know, where there's fire, there's smoke. And, but what we know is that wildfire smoke can actually be coming, can come into our region from wildfires happening in other parts of the interior west and also in British Columbia. And there's a whole other different set of issues that we need to be considering around wildfire smoke and how we can manage wildfire smoke in the near term and longer term. What are some of the, the what are the range of options we should be considering? So based on recommendations through that process, through that interview process and, and in consultation with those others, we committed to developing a King County wildfire smoke strategy. Hope to get going on that work in 2022. So, with that, I've got my contact information here. I'll drop it into the chat. Just wanted to, to share with you where we're going as a county and in terms of working with community partners around addressing these issues. And to just help reassure you that we're looking to move from what I would call random acts of, of preparedness or random acts of adaptation to a more systematic approach that will help really ensure that we're, we're uh, making the right investments to really uh, bring address this risk. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand over the speaking baton to Addison Houston, who is a colleague of mine at the uh, Seattle King County Public Health Department. So thank you and take it away, Addison. My name is Addison Houston. I am the Environmental Health Mitigation and Response Planner for Environmental Health Services Division at Public Health Seattle King County. All right, so when we talk about wildfires and wildfire smoke, um, it tends to get conglomerated into just this idea that it's just smoke. And what can be misleading is that wildfire smoke is actually this very complex mixture of dioxide, water vapors, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, uh, volatile organic chemicals, and compounds, as well as trace minerals and particulate matter. The pollutant of concern, though, that really we emphasize in public health is on particulate matter, and really particulate matter 2.5. That is the really fine particulate matter that can really get inhaled deep inside of our lungs and start causing a lot of issues with our respiratory system and our cardiovascular system and lead to a lot of health complications. And then also with um, wildfire smoke particulate matter, as we're starting to learn more about it, it's not the same as say just the dust that's floating around in your home. But as uh, wildfire actually burns, it fuses all these different volatile organic chemicals and compounds and whatever is in that smoke together and it binds actually with that particulate matter. So you're not just breathing in dust, but you're breathing in dust that's infused with this whole cocktail of different particulates and uh, chemicals that really can impact our long-term health. The groups most sensitive to wildfire smoke tend to include people with pre-existing medical conditions, especially with lung and heart disease, or people with uh, respiratory infections such as asthma or uh, D, um, and as well as now, unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, people who have or have had COVID-19. Uh, we are not clear um, or quite fully aware of what the health effects are from COVID-19 for those that have recovered long-term. So we wanna take extra precautions um, around our messaging and making sure that people who have had COVID-19 are aware that they may be at an increased risk to wildfire smoke this year than they have previously been. Um, other than that, we also see that children and infants being smaller, having a smaller lung size, they tend to breathe at a higher rhythm and rate. 
which can draw those particulate matter deep inside of their lungs and really affect their health, especially in the developmental stages. Um, and then people 65 years and older, pregnant women, outdoor workers, and even growing evidence is suggesting that there are significant impacts to the young and healthy. Symptoms of wildfire exposure really um, overlap with a lot of the symptoms that we see in COVID-19, which is actually shortness of breath, chest tightness, um, throat irritation, headache, uh, psychological stress, but also there are some differences that I'm sure that people are aware of. Nausea is not something you would ever really expect to come from wildfire smoke. So that might be an indication that there could be something else going on. But still, you can see there are these plethora of symptoms that occur when we're exposed to wildfire smoke. And I'm sure many of you on this call have actually experienced firsthand from last year's wildfire smoke event. Again, going into the overlap with the symptoms of wildfire smoke, we just really want to make sure that people are aware to distinguish whether they're experiencing effects from wildfire smoke or something that could be more serious, uh, such as COVID-19. But there's um, growing evidence that it's pretty easy to distinguish the two, but also that wildfire smoke can actually exacerbate the effects of COVID-19. So um, again, with the emphasis uh, we really want to take measures to protect our own health. We need to be cognizant that we have these dual threats coming at us, uh, both wildfire smoke and COVID-19, which both overlap in their respiratory impacts and therefore their impacts on our health. And the best defense to both is really actually turning out to be improvements to indoor air quality through ventilation and filtration of your indoor air. Some of the studies that we're starting to see are coming out um, suggesting that wildfire smoke actually does lead to uh, pretty severe uh, health outcomes, especially the day after exposure. Um, a study that was produced in 2019 uh, showed for general mortality, there is an increase in cardiovascular impacts, heart attack, heart failure, stroke, and all respiratory causes that led to um, premature death following the day of wildfire smoke exposure. Some other studies uh, coming out in our region specifically found that the increased odds of non-traumatic mortality actually increased by 2% uh, looking at syndromic surveillance data the day after exposure. So again, it's not that day that you're seeing the smoke and really experiencing it, it's those health effects the day after. It's your body responds to the inundation of particulate matter and that plethora of the cocktails that are infused with that particulate matter that you can breathe deep inside your body. And really one of the uh, things I wanna call out about that study is that the smoke levels um, from that study, we're actually fairly low compared to what we've seen and what we saw last year. So this is still an emerging science, but the study is suggesting that wildfire smoke is a lot more toxic than we previously assumed. Um, a lot of our metrics for measuring the health impact or health impacts of wildfire smoke are currently based on particulate matter observations, but the studies derived from particulate matter observations were largely uh, derived from diesel fuel emissions, which it turns out are fairly different from what we're seeing with wildfire smoke particulate matter. Um, there's also some suggestion that there is an overlap of actually these events that we're experiencing wildfire smokes and uh, the um, times of the year during the summer when ozone levels are actually highest that lead to this uh, compounding impact on our health by being experienced or exposed to both simultaneously. So last year, what we saw in our region was unprecedented since we began collecting air quality monitoring data. Um, 
throughout the region, we had a perfect storm of circumstances, both in wildfire behavior, wildfire uh, ignition starts, as well as weather conditions, which really resulted in this buildup of smoke in our region that just sat and lingered for days on end. And it seemed like an eternity, especially on the heels of the summer that we all missed because we were stuck inside due to a pandemic. But there are some things we can do um, and trying not to be all doom and gloom here, but some of the things we really need to start thinking about is how can we protect ourselves when these events occur? Because with the way that climate is changing and unfortunately as you've seen in this presentation the way that wildfire regimes are kind of increasing or kind of realigning with their natural cadence or rhythm wildfire smoke is something that our region is going to have to get used to on a routine basis uh, during the summer and it's unfortunate to see the beautiful summers that we've had in our region kind of fading away into these wildfire smoke season. But this is something we have to be aware of and things that we need to begin taking precautions about. So for our guidance for employers who have outdoor workers or people who may work outside, really reducing outdoor activities during periods where there is um, elevated wildfire smoke and I know it's hard to say, well, what is elevated wildfire smoke? If it's here, isn't it elevated? Generally, yes. If you can see the wildfire smoke outside and it visibly impairing your view, it's probably a good indication that you should start taking measures to reduce your outdoor activity, even if you're young and healthy, because we are seeing that that impact is occurring to those young and healthy because they tend to be the folks that think they can be more active and continue doing what they normally do without taking precautions. But really, everyone during wildfire smoke events should start reducing their outdoor activity. Next thing is to identify locations where you can go indoors to get out of wildfire smoke. And if possible, get indoors to an area that has an air conditioning system or has an HVAC system that can filter and uh, reduce the wildfire smoke particulates that may be lingering in the air, even coming indoors. Um, if you have employees, allow them to use sick leave during wildfire smoke events. Um, we don't always know who falls into the vulnerable, vulnerable groups of our population. So allowing that extra room for staff or employees to make their own informed decisions on their health to protect themselves in the best way that they know how is what we can all do to kind of allow people to seek more relief from wildfire smoke when there aren't a lot of options available. And then um, permitting the voluntary use of personal protection equipment if you have uh, employers, but um, there's an interesting rule that might be coming out this year. Uh, Washington Labor and Industries is actually in the process of an emergency rule adoption and followed by a prolonged permanent rulemaking process. Um, but this emergency rule is anticipated to come out ahead of this wildfire smoke season, which will actually require all employers in Washington state to provide N95 or KN95 uh, respirator mask for use for their employees during a wildfire smoke event. And the thresholds that they're looking at setting are again, fairly low. Um, so we could see these levels that would require staff or uh, employers to provide their staff with these masks quite often. Um, it's unknown what this could do to our supply chain, uh, considering we are still amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and these resources are likely going to be fairly hard to come by and find. Um, so that's something that's still being worked through uh, with the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. But um, in anticipation of this rule coming out, really taking heed of uh, potentially procuring those for your staff if you have staff that work outdoors. And then a lot of times we get questions around what 
to do around childcare services or outdoor events during wildfire smoke. Um, Washington State adopted this Washington Air Quality Advisory uh, threshold, which is similar to the Air Quality Index, which many people may be familiar with, but it is a little bit more sensitive uh, to the health outcomes and the health effects of particulate matter. And therefore, it urges us to take some actions a little bit earlier than if we just use the uh, Air Quality Index, which is the federal EPA standard. Um, at Public Health, we can use a public health officer order to recommend suspension or cancellation of outdoor events if wildfire smoke levels get bad enough. Um, but really, we ask the public to pay attention to their own health and really take measures to protect yourself. So don't rely on a public health officer order to cancel a major league event. If you're sensitive to wildfire smoke and you have tickets to go see an outdoor event or go do something outdoors, maybe think about that again and maybe take steps to protect your health. And then we always have to balance this, uh, rationale of science, social infrastructure, and political will when we're determining whether or not to issue a public health officer order. So really, again, taking steps to make your own informed decisions is going to be the best way to protect your health. Um, and how can you do that? Again, limiting your outdoor activities during wildfire smoke. You have pre-existing health conditions, work with your healthcare provider ahead of the wildfire smoke season, to make sure you have a plan in place to one, make sure that you can have any medications that you might need on hand during wildfire smoke events. And two, if you have any conditions that might be, might make you more sensitive to wildfire smoke, really knowing what steps you can take to manage and protect your health ahead of time by working with your health care provider, and getting a plan established, especially for those who have asthma or respiratory health conditions. And then keep indoor air clean or keep indoor air clean by reducing activities that contribute to indoor air pollution, such as frying anything on your uh, kitchen stove or sweeping, uh, vacuuming if you don't have a HEPA filter on your vacuum, um, burning candles. All those activities contribute to particulate matter in your indoor air, and if you can't let air indoors from outside, bring that in to alleviate that or all that particulate matter you're adding into your own air and indoors then just really takes away your uh, ability to have shelter from that wildfire smoke and the number one way to improve your indoor air quality is by increasing your ability to filter your indoor air if you have an existing uh, air conditioning system replacing your filters with a MERV 13 filter or higher or if you don't have a HVAC system or an air conditioning system, uh, portable HEPA uh, air filters will do a great job at filtering out air. And then a cost affordable method to uh, filtering your air is to create a do-it-yourself box fan air filter. The number one thing is make sure you take steps to prepare now is during a wildfire smoke event is not when you want to be going out to try to get your medication or to try to get filters or try to put together uh, equipment so you can have a clean air room. You want to do that now. And part of that also goes into the supply chain. What we found last year is because the wildfire smoke occurred so late in the year, a lot of stores stopped carrying the box fans so people couldn't make these filters or these box fan filters and a lot of stores at that time of year um, didn't have high availability of air filters um, that were readily available for people either. So by preparing early, you can take advantage of why supplies still last. So as alluded to, this uh, DIY box fan filter is one of the best low cost solutions to actually improve your indoor air quality. Actually, Laura um, and myself are working with a couple of other colleagues in conjunction with the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency to actually distribute about 
400 of these box and filter kits out to our frontline communities that are most impacted by the effects of climate change. And also with that, trying to teach them how to put these together and be ambassadors within their own community to ensure that communities have systems in place to know where they can go during wildfire smoke events and know how to improve their indoor air quality around the year. Uh, these box fans clean about 300 square feet every 15 minutes. So compared to a HEPA filtration unit, um, they are almost as effective and they run about a fraction of the price. So this is one of the things that we're really finding a lot of benefit with, especially for people who may not have access to being able to um, replace their air conditioning system to accommodate a higher filter or to necessarily afford buying a portable air filtration device. So with that, thank you all very much. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that may be coming up. Um, but otherwise, here's my contact information and thank you. I would definitely like to give a special thanks to our presenters for giving up their time to bring this information to King County residents. And as that said, I will leave it up to Rosie to take us out. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to all presenters. Thank you all for your time and for attending the webinar tonight. We really appreciate it. Hope you have a good rest of your night.